Welcome to the Korea Society. My name is Jayo. I'm the Senior Director of Arts and Culture. Duna is a novelist and film critic and a former chair of the Korean Science, Korean Science Fiction Writers Union. For more than 20 years, they have published as a face right, faceless writer, refusing to reveal personal details regarding age, gender, or legal name. Widely considered to be one of South Korea's most important science fiction writers, Duna has published 10 short story collections and five novels so far. Counterweight is the first full-length novel by Duna to be published in the United States, and we are thrilled to have its translator, Anton Herr, with us tonight. Anton Herr is the award-winning translator of many Korean literature, including Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung, which was shortlisted for the 2022 International Booker Prize and is the 2023 National Book Award finalist for translated literature. His other translation, among many others, includes Sang Young Park's Love in the Big City, Kyung Suk Shin's I Went to See My Father, and Baek Se His I, Went, I Want to Die But I Want to Eat Tteokbokki. And his first novel, written in English, titled Toward Eternity, will be published in 2024. He's joined on the stage by Matthew Sharapa, marketing and social media manager for The Knopf and host of the self-titled BookTube and Bookstagram channels. You'll have your own chance to ask Anton your questions. If you are joining us online for live webcast, please send your questions via email, artsandculture at koreasociety.org. And Counterweight by Duna is available for sales tonight. We would like to thank You and Me Bookstore once again for handling the book sales. Counterweight is, of course, available wherever books are sold, including You and Me Bookstore's website. And now, without much further ado, please welcome Anton Herr and Matthew Sharapa. Thank you so much. It is such a treat, such an honor to be here. Um, I am a product of both my generation and my job, so I have all of my notes on my phone. Um, so I'm not texting while I'm up here. I'm just I'm looking at what I want to ask Anton today. Um, but thank you to the Korea Society. Thank you to everyone joining us, both at home and in person. Thank you to anybody who voted today. That's wonderful. Um, Anton, you and I have known each other for several years now, so it's always such a treat when I get to pick your brain. and. Um, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> um, so let's start with, for such a slim novel, Counterweight is incredibly complex. It has several plot threads, but even in the first two pages of the prologue, you get conversations about mortality, about the nature of reality. And I want to challenge you in this moment, and I promise this is the only pun I will make tonight. Um, what is your elevator pitch for Counterweight? What is Counterweight to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you, Korea Society, for having us, and thank you for uh, coming to our event. Um, before I answer your question, I just want to point out like the reason I, we really wanted Matthew to be here especially was because he was one of the first people who really promoted Korean literature and translation um, through his very popular YouTube uh, booktube account and also through like his online socials and so uh, I kind of like knew his work before I knew him and we kind of like became friends through that and so he's kind of like I know he doesn't look it but he is kind of like an icon of Korean literature <laughs> in translation uh, so we're very very happy I was just so thrilled that he said yes to this um, so importantly this book uh, was about half of my books I pitch and the other half they kind of come to me after they've been acquired or whatnot. With this book, it was kind of like a weird hybrid of that because um, I was kind of, I stepped in in the pitching. Uh, it, the book hasn't the author has an agent, and the agent was pitching the book. But um, when I realized who the uh, agents were pitching to, I was like, "Ooh, can I step in?" Because I kind of know the editor. I've met him, and so they allowed me to pitch it. And I do not quite remember like all of the specifics of the pitch, 
But I do know that I did, I was doing everything in my power. Like it was more than an elevator pitch really. Like I think I wrote up the proposal at one point. And also I used to run a radio show, like a radio segment in Korea about um, untranslated Korean books. And I deliberately put this book on that show <laughs> so that I would have an entire script uh, that I could give to the editor <laughs> subsequently. So I gave him that script. I like had you know the synopsis and they actually asked me to redo the sample before they consider. And so I redid the sample, something that I almost never do. But, um, and also there was also um, like, we were coming home from vacation and it's, you know, it's evening in Korea when it's morning in New York and my husband was driving. And so it's like late at night and the editor calls and then I'm about to take the call and my husband goes, really, you're on vacation? And I'm like, this is Knopf. I have to take the call. I really want to be published by Knopf. Um, it was Pantheon and Knopf are like the same family. And so I took the call and uh, my editor, to his credit, was like, are you sure you want to take this call? Even he was like, are you sure you want to take this call? Like, are you in a, you're in a car right now? And I'm like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. So uh, for me, it was, I was just so determined to um, get this book sold. It's kind of, it's a, it is a very small book, but it deals with a lot of really big, big, big topics. Um, every time I think about it, like the, the most important thing of, of it shifts. Now I feel like it really is a book about colonialism and how, what colonialism looks like in our century, although I think it's technically set <laughs> in the future. Um, because colonialism doesn't look like uh, a country goes to another country and then like it, there's a kind of like colonialism that looks like 19th century colonialism and then 20th century colonialism and now 21st century colonialism. It looks very different. It's very corporate. It's driven by, I mean, it was always corporate, but now it's more, it's less, has less to do with um, blatantly taking away the sovereignty of another country. You, there's kind of more layers to it. There's more lip service. There's more like, it looks like you're giving, you're doing the the target country a favor by bringing in jobs and capital and whatnot. But there are all these these insidious like things that um, that population is giving up without them knowing. And counterweight deals with a lot of those issues, despite how uh, short uh, it is. And the other interesting thing um, that it deals with, oh, sorry, I'm totally not answering your question right now. But, but these were all the things that I put into the pitch. Like it had to do with AI. It had to do with our attitudes towards AI. This is very important. And it also had to do with colonialism. And that's kind of like how I tried to sell the book. I also said that this is also action packed. It's very plot driven. Like it is a thriller. It's very like a, you know those like science fiction books, like for, oh, maybe you don't, you're, He's a Zodiac cycle younger than I am, like Asian Zodiac, so he's much younger than I am. But for those of you who remember the 80s, um, you know those like paperback science fiction novels that are like so exciting to read and they have like the trashiest covers. Like it's a book like that. And I kind of wanted that kind of cover, but then when we saw the actual cover for Counterweight, I was like, oh, actually this is really gorgeous. I, I can't say no to this cover. But it has elements, like cinematic elements like that. So I really wanted to say, that yes, this is a book that, that is very cinematic, but also extremely like it. All of the place names, for example, come from uh, colonial literature. Um, none of the place names are really made up uh, by the author. So that's really cool. So I would, keep, I would keep saying things like that in the elevator, in the very long space elevator ride that was this pitch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I set you up with a whole elevator pun. Yes. Um, this book Thank does you. deal with an <laughs> elevator to space mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is connected to a counterweight. And I think you have done a really good job of summarizing a lot of what the imagery points towards. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I sell this book at Comic Cons, I get to do that. It's one of the best things in my job. Um, the pitch itself, I think, really entices people, but something that I think draws people in even more is the anonymity of the author. Um, who is Juna, and do you have access to them? Do you know more than others might? Um, can you tell us about Juna to your knowledge? Sure. Juna, so I actually have spoken to Juna, but I've never met Juna in person. I don't know if Juna's agents have met Juna in person. We don't know if Duna is a man or a woman, how old they are. Although you can, like, by their tastes, you can kind of guess how old they are or what generation they are, at least. 
Um, they have been writing for a long time. Uh, they, um, they like, how do I, like, do you guys remember Prodigy and CompuServe? And so Korea used to have things like that, internet service providers, um, which now means something different. Oh, God, this is all so arcane. But so Korea used to have something like Prodigy and CompuServe, and the Duna used to write in those, like, 90s internet forums um, and uh, with, like, you know, serial novels, and mo but mostly reviews, like movie reviews. And so people know Duna more, as, used to know Duna more as a critic than uh, as a writer. But now Duna, of course, has sub published several short story collections and novels and whatnot. Um, we still don't know anything about Duna, like what they look like. I have talked to Duna, um, but very, very briefly, like they have like DM'd me on Twitter um, because they didn't like certain things about the translation. <laughs> what thing? They're, they're very minor. Okay. They're very minor, like like place names or whatever. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I, I'm right, but you know, they're the author. And so, um, and, they, and they also kind of like, don't really talk about the translation. Um, they don't talk much, <laughs> they don't talk much in general. So I haven't really had an occasion to really interact with them. And for me, this is something very normal because it's very rare that I talk to my authors at all. Like, Pek Sehi, I want to die, but I want to eat dakboki. I've never spoken to her, even in DM. I've spoken to her less than I've spoken to Duna. Um, you know, Hwang Seokyung, I've never talked to him or even emailed him. Like, there, there are certain authors that I talk to all the time, like Bora Chung, but we don't really talk about literature or... Like she's here now <laughs> in the room. Um, like we don't really talk about literature or translation. We just send each other cat memes. Like, you know, we don't have a real conversation. Like we have funny conversations. So yeah, so this so for me it's very normal not to really interact with your author. Mm -hmm. Um so I really don't know that much about Duna. And I like I like not knowing much about Duna. I like the fact that they are very private. I think it's um it on some level, it, sometimes it like makes um, it easier for me to have my own reading, which is crucial if you want to be a literary translator. You have to have your own reading of the text and in order for you, for you to create a cohesive like translation. Otherwise, you know, why do it? Give it to an AI. Speaking yeah. of AI, um, did you find any irony in translating a book about AI? The, the grand scheme of it all being that AI is going to obviously take your job. <laughs> That's a joke. That's <laughs> well, an AI has actually taken my job for this book because um, the because Duna is very intrigued by AI translation. So I think like for some of the promotional material, they had AI do the translation. But I'm not super worried about AI taking over my job because my job is actually 80% emails and 20% translation. So until an AI can write that emails, <laughs> can write those emails for me, um, Microsoft is actually testing an email writing AI. And I was so excited when I heard this because I like translation and I like translating. That's the part of my job where I don't need help. I'm actually very good at it too, you know. But email writing, that's the part of my job that I do not like. I am so tired of solving all of these problems that should not be mine to solve. For example, um, as Jay mentioned when she was introducing us, I have a novel coming out next year, and people ask me, like, what's it like being a novelist after being a translator? And I'm like, oh, it's, like, so easy being a writer. Because all you have to, like, if you have a problem, like, if your editor tells you, oh, there's a problem over here, then you can just, like, make stuff up, and then the problem goes away. With a translation, it's like solving a really difficult math problem. I have to get all of the stakeholders involved, like look at the source and be like, okay, these are the constraints of the problem. There's many constraints. I have to find one that is just a solution that is just right. It takes forever. And also, the other thing is, translating may be easy enough for an AI to do, although that's still debatable, in my opinion. Um, being a translator is extremely difficult. Being a translator is much harder than being a writer. When you're a writer, and I just published my first book in Korean um, last month, it's so e it was so easy that I feel like I don't even have a book out. And whenever someone mentions it, I'm like, oh, right, I did write a book, and it is out. 
um, because when you are putting a book out as a translator, there is so much work that you have to do, so much work. You have to go through several galleys, but even before then, you have to do like a lot of editing where you have to like figure things out about the source text that you probably don't really have to struggle with when you're writing your own text. Well, I didn't for either of my books, whether in Korean or English. And also, like, your role as a writer is very clearly defined because it is a traditional role that's been passed down for, you know, hundreds of years. So it's very clear, this is the writer's job, this stuff you give to your agent, this stuff you give to your editor or your translator. But with a translator, it's like, they ask you to solve problems that the author cannot really solve because they don't speak English or they don't speak the target language. And so, and the editor doesn't speak Korean normally. Uh, so it becomes like who solves those problems? It's the translator because they're the only ones who have like all the tools. And so uh, a lot of the times when as a translator uh, and there are mil like think of all the problems that can arise from a book, uh, from the, the beginning to the end of a production of a book, from you know, pitching to, um, to promotion, PR, like think of all the problems that can arise and who can solve that? You know, it has to be the translator. And that is what I want AI to be able to do, <laughs> but that's just not going to happen in my lifetime. There are two kinds of AI. There's narrow AI and general AI. Narrow AI is AI that is capable of doing very repetitive, simple tasks. Peop and general AI is basically like, you know, you look at a science fiction novel and they're like people. Like, um, I don't know, like that's computer on Star Trek, the next generation is a general AI. Everyone thinks that being a translator is a form of narrow AI. This is very insulting to me as a translator because they think like, oh, my job is that simple. My job is not that simple. My job involves so much more than just translating. And that's why I'm confident that no AI can replace me, certainly not in my working lifetime. But you are very welcome to try, especially if you're Microsoft. Please go ahead with that AI. I would really love, like even that stupid Google Mail thing where they suggest answers to you. I use it all the frigging time. <laughs> I love it. Like that little thing has improved the quality of my life so much. Like there are entire days where like all I do is write emails and then it's like, oh, it's five o'clock. I have to go and cook dinner for my husband. And I'm like, what are you? And he's like over dinner. He's like, what did you do all day? I'm like, emails. <laughs> I didn't translate a word. I would like to not live that life anymore. Sorry, long answer. No, I love that answer. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we'll avoid the emails, that is, it seems a, a sore subject. But then what about that other percentage, the actual art and craft of translation? Mm -hmm. You know, what does your day to day look like working with an editor, which to me seems interesting, right? Because this book has already had its own life already once and you are bringing a new life to it. So you're not really editing the book in the way that a traditional book would be edited, what are you instead doing? What do you do with Todd all day at Pantheon? <laughs> <laughs> so Todd Portnowitz, who's here, yay. Um, so it's Todd, as far as I know, does not read Korean, which is extremely, for me, very, it's not very useful in the acquisition process, but once the book is acquired and you are editing it, it's super useful because this is a person who is not prejudiced by the Korean text. And so they can only look at my translation. And so they are able to identify exactly what the translation needs. And they don't care about like what's in Korean. And that's the editor that you want. That's also, if you happen to be an aspiring writer, for example, it's very useful to have someone who doesn't really, who doesn't really know you, basically. Had, like, try to bring your manuscript to some kind of controlled environment, an MFA program or a workshop or something, where you can give it to a reader that, you, that doesn't really know you, but you can still trust. And just like let them give like their honest opinion of if I pick this book up, like if I picked, sorry, split verb, if I picked up this book like in a bookstore, would I, you know, would I continue reading blah blah blah? Like that's a very useful thing to have. And so with this book, there we had to gloss so much. Um, Could you give us a definition? Like, what do you mean by glossing? Sure. Yeah. Um, so glossing, um, the way the way that I use it, or stealth glossing. This is a term invented by uh, Jason Grunbaum, who is um, a translator from, I believe, Hindi, like Indian languages. 
And Jason came up with this term to uh, describe what literary translators do when, for example, we have a word, the cognate, like the, it doesn't quite exist in the target language, which is like 100% of words, frankly. And so you would put little words next to that word in order to sort of explain it without being too intrusive. Um, for example, God, I don't know, like, I mean, everyone knows what kimchi is now, but let's say it's like the year 2000 and no one knows what kimchi is. And so I had to say kimchi, or I would say, instead of saying just, oh, she ate the kimchi, uh, I would say she ate the pickled radish kimchi. Like I would add like two more words or one more word so that people have a general idea of, oh, this is that. So um, because we're not really, P uh, translators translating into English, we're not really allowed to use footnotes like they do in other countries because editors are constantly telling us that um, English readers will not read footnotes and they're completely allergic to footnotes and will not buy a, will throw a book across the room if they see a footnote. <laughs> so stealth glossing is what we resort to. For this book, um, we had to do a lot, a lot of that, even more than normal because it is a made up world, science fiction. I mean, it is set in you know, the uh, South Pacific and whatnot, but, <clears throat> excuse me, it, um, it's set in a world where a lot of things that we would not take for granted now are taken for granted. And also, the style in which this book was written in Korean is what we call, like a lot of people have commented in, the, in Korea, in, like reviews in Korea have said that, oh, this is pulchinjorada, like this is not, this is impolite. This is an impolite text. Impolite text meaning they don't really, ex it doesn't really explain itself. It doesn't really go out of its way to uh, make things clear for the reader. And indeed, there were a lot of moments where Todd and I would be like, what's going on here? And then we would have to make an executive decision as to what was going on here. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm totally fine with, with doing that. The, a huge issue when it comes to translating from Korean to English uh, is that infamously, um, English readers are very lazy and English writers are very, very diligent. Like English writers will make something very, very clear and easy for the lazy English reader to understand. However, it's the other way around in Korean. Korean readers are extremely diligent, but Korean writers are very lazy. Like Korean writers, if you read a Korean book, like a Korean novel, it, they never like open with like a bang. It's always like some vague mood for about three pages and then something happens or a character's name is mentioned. Sometimes the story will not have, will not name its characters or will never name like the setting and everything will be very vague from beginning to end. Why? Because this is literary art. This is, you know, and so, literature. And so if you are translating from, let's say, English to Korean, you are translating diligent writers for diligent readers. So there's very little to traverse. If you are translating from Korean to English like me, you are translating lazy writers for lazy readers. So the gap that we have to traverse is dramatic. This is part of why there are like 7 billion more um, translators going from uh, English to Korean than there are from Korean to English. I'm a very rare species. There are maybe like 15 working literary translators, you know, um, uh, in my language combination going in that direction. So with Duna, um, while this is a very action-packed book, we had to do, make a lot of decisions to make it easier for the lazy readers of <laughs> America and the UK because, uh, and even then, we, I would look at reviews and, or Amazon reviews for the translation and they'd be like, you know, some, some of the things aren't really explained that I'd be like, oh, like after all that we did to traverse that gap, because there would be moments where like, God, like um, I remember one of the things where the editorial was asking me was, so how exactly does this elevator work? Because it's not like super clear. So I, I also think that it's not super clearly explained in the, in the book, in the Korean book. So I was like drawing it. I was like, okay, there is a counterweight attached to a cable and the elevators do not go up and down using um, a balancing counterweight like they do on earth. 
but the counterweight keeps the cable taut using centrifugal force, and the elevators have legs that crawl up the cable, and that's how people go up and down. So this isn't like super clearly explained in the book, and I had to do a lot of figuring out. Oh my god, I have to tell the story because. So there is a point where they go up the elevator, and um, there and like they they take some kind of drug that that speeds up time. And so they're looking at the stars move, and the planet is rotating. Our Earth is rotating, so all of the larger star, all the faraway stars of the galaxy are moving at a fast pace. But um, Venus, Mars, and another planet, like you know, the planets of our solar system, are moving slower uh, in one direction. And I was given so many notes about this from Todd from Pantheon. And I was like trying to imagine it in my mind, so many times. My my husband is an engineering PhD from Seoul National University. Like he couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I I was like uh, I was like about to ask Chanda Prescott Weinstein, the the you know the uh, the astrophysicist. But it was but but I was I don't know what what came up. Like and she's very busy, and so. <laughs> And I was like just lying in bed, trying to like visualize, like well, like how would that work? The planet is spinning, so and that's why the stars are the far away stars are going faster. But why wouldn't the planets then move even faster because they're closer to us? And this, like, I could not figure it out. And so I, at one point, we had to give up. Like this was something that was flagged in the first edit, the second edit, the copy edit. Like everyone flagged it. Like. This makes no sense. This makes no sense. This makes no sense. And I'm like, at this point, I was like, uh, it's it's just it's it's just this is the most literally translated part of the book. <laughs> like, so if you if you want to blame someone, please blame Juna. <laughs> please blame the author for this one because we really tried. I got motion sickness trying to figure this out, and uh, yeah, it's it's still traumatic to me. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Oh, I hope Juna isn't watching. <laughs> So is, is, do you think that, so is this solely a, a product or of Juna's work or is it science fiction in general? Do you think that you would come across an issue like that in any work of Korean science fiction that you would translate? Oh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's fiction, like, you know, and it's not, it's not always going to be super accurate. And it's really not about, we're not writing, you know, futurist papers here, we're writing fiction. So of course we have to do our due diligence and do our best to make things scientifically sensical. But at some point it has to be like we have to let it go. Like there's, we do our best, but and you know a book like this, like if you discover a typo, you're like, oh typo, people are not doing their jobs. But the thing is, like a book that comes out of like a big five or you know any kind of like respectable independent publisher, like ten people have read it word for word. And still, we get you know mistakes and that kind of thing. So that's something that we really have to let go of. Like the perfection is the enemy of published. Like we can't. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah. And so you know, English language readers have such little exposure to Korean fiction in general. You're working very hard, thank you. Um, but also specifically to Korean science fiction, is counterweight emblematic of Korean science fiction at large, or? Could you speak a little bit more towards what is the market that you're trying to now bring into the English language? Hmm. So science fiction in America and the UK tends to be about large spaceships going around colonizing space. This is because you are an empire. <laughs> and this is because the United Kingdom is an empire. This, for you, is your science fiction. If we wrote science fiction like that, it would look ridiculous like Koreans in a spaceship going to another planet and colonizing it like like that would it would just be ridiculous this is not my idea this is Bae Myung-hun's idea uh Bae Myung-hun is the author of Tower translated by Sung Ryu uh published by Onward Star is it has it come out here I don't think it's come out here um so so he's this uh famous science fiction writer in Korea and he was like so Korean science fiction has to be something different it has to feel different so what is Korean? So how does Korean science fiction have to feel? It's very dystopian <laughs> because Korea is very dystopian. <laughs> um, think of Squid Game. 
uh, that's like our go-to reference now for Korean science fiction. Think of how dark Cursed Bunny is. Um, think of how dark this book is. This book is interesting. So this book is about empire in some sense. It is about colonization, but not colonization through like the normal apparatus, the normal apparatus of empire. It's through like, you know, um, corporate interests, it's through capitalism. And that is something Korea very much does. Um, like Korea, uh, Korean, large, we have large Korean companies called Chaebol, and they go to um, foreign countries and they buy up resources and exploit labor and do all of the horrible things uh, that you know, colonists from the 19th century used to do. And so now that we are doing that, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that at Korea Society. <laughs> Thank you, sponsors. We love you. Uh, we love everybody. Um, yeah, so, uh, God, how did I get to that? Yeah, so Korean science fiction, yeah, kind of like has to do with um, maybe that kind of that kind of colonization, but mostly about you know the effects of capitalism, the effects of dystopia, the effects of living in a society where very strange and weird things are considered normal. The thing that makes Bora Chung's Cursed Bunny so so ring true, so truer than most fiction, is that the most ridiculous, the most absurd things happen in that book. But the way the characters react to them is completely casual. They're like, oh, that happened? OK. Because it's so normal. That kind of horrible things that happen under capitalism is so normal now that people are completely dead to it. Like a genocide can and is happening somewhere in the world, not in more than one place. And people are still, you know, doing book talks. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, so like, it's so, if you think about it, if you really think about it, it's completely absurd. But that is the dystopia that we live in. And no one is and does dystopia better than Korea. And that's why our science, and that's what our science fiction, I think, brings to the world. So does that inform your approach then? If we're talking about like tonally or how you want to deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is perhaps a question about interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, how does this kind of concept of Korean science fiction at large inform like the one-on-one -on -one work that you're doing with the page? Hmm, very little, I think. Yeah, when I'm actually working, I'm more concerned with the author's language. Um, for example, Duna was, as I said, Puchinzorada was impolite. And so more, it's more of an issue of how do I, I do like how Duna doesn't bother to explain a lot of things in, in a sense, because I, I like the way that people just like take certain things for granted, which that's, that is kind of similar to what Bora is doing, but very different in a different way. And so I wanted to preserve that, you know, to a degree. And so for me, when I'm, when I'm picking the books, of course, I think about empire and you know, love and violence and trauma and all of, all of those big themes. But that's only when I'm picking a book and when I'm pitching a book, uh, when I'm actually doing the work, it has to be, at least for the first and most, the first draft is most important. The first draft, it's, it has to be like, how, like what is, you know, Duna doing on the page? What is Kyung Suk Shin doing on the page? Like, why did they use this word and not this word? And how would I emulate this effect in the English if it's an important effect? How can I change it so that it improves what it's supposed to do or what, what they want to do? So all of those concerns are kind of like, my concerns when I'm actually translating are, at that point, are much more technical. It's like when you are you know, in college. My brother, told, my brother was in the same college and same major as me, and he would tell me, you know, it's, you know, who you sign up with is extreme, like what classes you sign up with is half your grade. So it's the same when you pick a book to translate. Like, I can't do all of that thinking while I'm translating, although I guess you can sort of do it that way, but it would be very exhausting. Like you have to, when you make a commitment to translate a book, like you have to be like all in at that point and you have to be able to justify the book and be able to justify your choices as a translator. Otherwise, again, you can just ask an AI to do it because they don't do any of that kind of thinking. And yeah. Um, I think you've done such a good job encapsulating so much of this book, but um, I get you often in conversation. All of you do not. So um, I would love to open up to some audience questions. If anybody has any for Anton, um, would love to hear. This part's always a little shy. Mm. <laughs> I believe a microphone's coming around. Oh, good night. Thank you so much for coming, both of you. Um, my question would be, 
while translating and without any spoilers, if possible, what do you think was your favorite part of the journey in translating this book? My favorite part of translating any book is when I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> is when I get an offer in the email that says, yes, Anton, we are going to sign this book. I'm like, yes! I cry, I literally cry because I am so happy. It's like, because I was a translator, a professional translator. I have been a professional translator since I graduated college. I've never had any other job. I was a tr really a professional translator during college as well. So for me, um, doing the job itself is always pleasant and it's nice. But for me, it's really like getting the work is so difficult and fraught with so much drama and strife. And like there's just that line from uh, Mad Men where Peggy tells Don, reminds Don actually like, oh no, doing the job is easy. It's getting the job that's difficult. And yeah, so it's, it's so crass of me. To, I mean, I'm a very crass person. Like it's so crass of me to say this, but like when I get the job, like when I finally, when, I, when the book is sold and the offer comes in, that's like, open champagne that's like yeah my life look at my life i'm so doing so great like look at me now dad like <laughs> like that that is like the best moment so like when this book got sold i was like oh my god i'm gonna be at knopf double day pantheon <laughs> and however many vintage anchor yeah oh, that, that group yeah i was i was just so happy that because um one of the things that i would tell like one of the things that i would tell people uh, around that time and, and now to some extent is that I love independent presses and they've done so much for Korean literature. Now we kind of like, I would like Korean authors to like make some money. Like, because we punch so far above our weight. We publish so few books in English, but we have, but they sold, sell really well. Like Almond, um, I want to die, but I want to eat Dokoki. I just got royalty statements from, from Violets which was not a bestseller in Korea by any means. But here, like, I got royalty. Like, it made its money back and then some. So I think, I hope. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So I'm like, come on. Like, we, so I would like um, these really big prestigious publishers, like, you know, Pantheon, uh, to, for, to, like, you know, pay more attention to Korean literature and for us to, like, for, our, for to give our authors more money. And so uh, that was a really great moment when the sale came through because and of course I love translating it and I love promoting it and you know all of that and it's just it gives me a lot of joy when um oh the other really great thing is when I come across reviews where readers completely understand what I meant you know at this like when they enjoy the when it's very clear with that they enjoyed the book the way I enjoyed it that's like the best like I can't believe it worked like it's worked several times now but still every time it works I'm like oh my god you got it I got it. Like, it's, it's such a great feeling. Yeah. I can't really, like, translating this book, like, God, what is, at every, for every book, like, the really, it, when it comes to the translation part of it, like, the, ver the nicest moment is when I know exactly when this is, how this is supposed to sound like. Because a lot of the times when you get a book, especially if it's an author that you've never translated before, you're like, I don't know what this person is supposed to sound like in English. And so you ask the author, so what American or British writers do you like? Like, I don't care about the rest. Like, what, what in these two countries? And they'd be like, like, I asked Sang Young Park that question. And he's like, oh, I like Chuck Palahniuk. I like um, David Sedaris. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to make you sound like both of them. <laughs> and, like, I start translating. And I, and I, like, and I, I don't even think of Sang Young Park. I think of those two authors. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it works. It works. Like, when it connects like that, it's like, when you get the voice, that's really great. It's like a struggle before you get the voice. Like, sometimes I would be translating a book, and I'm, like, on page 50 or even, like, a third in. God, what was that book? Oh, Blood of the Old Kings um, by Kim Sung. -in. It's not out yet. Uh, it's been published by Tor. Tor was another publisher I so wanted to work with. I'm so happy that I did get to... Every time I, sh like, I talk about the project, some of them are like, Tor, like, Tor, Tor. Like, everyone's reaction is the same. It's, it's so great. Anyway, so, uh, like, I gave it to, like, Authors Guild for contract vetting. And then um, Umer at Authors Guild, he's like, 
oh my god, it's a tour, like science fiction tour? And I was like, yes, yes. Anyway, so um, with that book, because this was a genre that I'm not familiar with, it's like high fantasy. It's not a genre that I read a lot in or, or write in or whatever. So for me, like getting the voice took like 40% of that manuscript. But once I got it, I was like, yes, I know what this is supposed to sound like now. And then it was like, it just, like I could do 5,000 words a day. Like, it, like the rest was so easy. And then I went back to the beginning and like redid everything and like, yeah. So that is like, when you're translating, that is the nicest thing. When, when you get it, when you have built the narrator in your mind and then you are the narrator and then, yeah, it's the greatest feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question from an online viewer. Uh, Dorian asks, I am under the impression that your translations of Duna's Counterweight or Borachang's Cursed Punny are marketed as translated fiction rather than genre fiction, genre fiction, whether sci-fi, sci horror, or else, does this play in the book's favor or against them? Is the Korean book market similarly genre-graded, uh, genre or is this a U.S. market thing? This is a really great question. I asked, uh, was it me? Someone asked Jeff Vandermeer the same question, and like he has the key answer. So he said, he asked his publishers the same reason. Why is my, why are my books in the literary fiction section and not science fiction, horror, or genre? And his publishers told him, well, science fiction writers will go to the literary fiction shelf, but literary fiction readers will not go to the science fiction shelf. And that's the only reason. That is the reason that we have today. Yeah. The um, genre has always been really big in publish. I mean, you know this better than I do probably and can speak on it more than I can. But um, there has been kind of like in recent years, uh, like Kazuo Ishiguro is basically a science fiction writer now. Like there has been in recent years, like very mainstream uh, literary fiction writers kind of like making the like since the, I guess the 90s or the, or the noughties, when was it when, when Margaret Atwood came up with all of those Mad, Mad Adam books, like around that time, I guess, where everyone seemed to be pivoting to speculative fiction and everyone seemed to be pivoting to science fiction. And yeah, that's, uh, it's all just marketing. Um, I read this really great book about uh, the, the mainstreamification of luxury fashion called Deluxe by Dana Thomas. And in it, she in she interviews. Um, I think it was the the nose for Chanel, the person who you know makes the perfumes for Chanel, and they asked him like, "So, what's the difference between you know women's perfume and men's perfume?" And he says, "Marketing. They're the same. Yeah, but the only difference is marketing. So, gender is marketing. <laughs> gender is a construct. It does not exist. It's just marketing. Okay." Thank you for that question, I, Dorian. I believe the second mm -hmm. part of that question, which I'm very curious about, is is uh, genre as segmented in Korea as it is in the States? It is getting better, um, mostly thanks to Bora Chong, um, because like now when I see Boris books in bookstores, like they are kind of like, huh, like they're they're with the literary fiction. So it is getting better, but it could do better. Um, science fiction. I don't know if science fiction, like, there, there have been a lot of science fiction writers, but I don't know if it's sold, like, really, really, really well, although there have been, like, uh, Yeongdo, and, like, there are exceptions. But for the most part, um, there is quite a genre separate, uh, segregation and separ separation in Korea, mostly because, like, Korea has a literary translation, like, licensing authority. If you do not earn an author's license through um, this very complicated author system that I will not go into, you're basically not considered like a, a, like a serious author, like a literary fiction author. Bora Chung, for example, did not come through the system, but you know she she got a Booker nomination anyway. So, which was very vindicating. Like when she won the Penheim, that's when I was like, yes, that's like you can have your author licensing system. Like you can have it. You can shove it up your whatever. Bora Chung won a Penheim, so that's that's when I was like. We can survive without without being in part of the Korean mainstream, but yeah, in Korea there is still quite a division, and um, a lot that we have to kind of like fight against. Another question from the viewer is: 
Do you think there's any advantage for um, sort of hiding the identity of the author in the Korean market versus in the US market? How has this book been marketed in Korea versus in the United States? And do you think that has sort of um, been an advantage for the book or disadvantage? I have no idea. Like, I don't have the, maybe my editor sitting here can give you the sales data. But, <laughs> but like, you know, it works out for some authors like Elena Ferrante. Like, obviously, it's, she's done um, well despite not having revealed her identity. The, I really don't know. I think being anonymous has enabled Duna to be more productive than otherwise. Is anonymity or having a pen name common place or because in the states it's certainly not it is very hard mm -hmm. nowadays especially nowadays mm -hmm. to be disconnected from your name because your name is a brand and you have to work very hard on building that and mm -hmm. connecting your work to that people care about a personality uh -huh. um is it as rare is this a rare occurrence so <laughs> i mean bora's right here so i don't want to tell her story which is hers to tell but it, it's just such a hilarious story that i want to tell it sorry um like, so she actually had a pen name when she started, a lovely pen name, but then her, one of her, I mean, her, her real name is also lovely, but for some reason, her, like, after her first publisher, like, her second or third publisher was like, you know, we want to be able to use the fact that you went to Yale for grad school, like, in the, in the bio, and in order to do that for some reason, they had to use a real name, like in order to like use her um, credentials as an academic. Uh, so they kind of like outed her. <laughs> and so she kind of like has two names in publication. And I wanted to use my pen name because I'm, you know, a, I am a sensible person. I'm not gonna use my passport name and flaunt it around for people to like forge me like already you know I've had a scammer pretend to be me that guy that um the spine collector guy like he went around pretending to be Anton her so I already have like that kind of I don't want that to happen so I use a pen name Anton her however um the Korean press for some reason keeps outing me like using my Korean name they're like Anton her and then and then parentheses real name whatever and I'm like why do they I don't know why they do that it's some kind of like Korean um, compulsion to report your neighbor to the secret police or something. <laughs> very Stasi, very like Eastern Germany, South Korea in the 70s kind of like mentality. Like I don't understand why you need to put my business out in the world like that, Korean journalists. So yeah, what was the question? Oh, anonymity, yeah. <laughs> so anonymity. Yeah, I think um, we live in an age where you can build who you are, like a brand, but also your very persona. You can create a new person, whether it's online or whether it's whatever. And it was really when Duna was coming up in the 90s where that, that became more and more possible in Korea, where people were using you know, screen names and online personalities. And so Duna is basically like a child of that internet uh, era, the 90s internet era. Now it's like, everyone's data is leaked so we, we don't have that anonymity so much anymore but yeah yeah I think um like I I so wanted to separate like my professional life from my personal life because like I don't like I just want to take off Anton her and just like put him in the closet like at, at, after the day's over for my own you know mental health because um especially when you're a translator um the like the demarcation between this is your job and this is not your job is so vague and all constantly moving that I kind of like need to not be Anton her on occasion. And yeah, so I <laughs> salute Duna. <laughs> Any, I, I think anyone should, you know, have that, have that um, because there's something to being a writer where this, this is especially, I found more useful as not a translator, but as an author, is that it's very useful to have another you, like another you that you can talk to. Like, okay, I'm Anton Her, and now I'm talking to the person who is not Anton Her, or vice versa. And so we can have a discussion, and sometimes that discussion is 
the book that you are reading, like the narrative. That's where that's where narrative is generated. So I find it useful in that sense as well. So um, I'm all for building your personality, building a kind of like thing. And it's interesting that you know authors did this before we had internet. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Um, can you talk a little bit more about creating the voice? And I guess I'm thinking, like, as you're translating word by word, mm -hmm. I would imagine that creates a sense of voice on its own. But when you're describing it, it sounds more intentional, like behind, um, right? Like, which comes first, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There are seven billion ways to translate the same sentence, obviously. And also, if you have a voice in mind, it's, uh, translation becomes like a million times easier. Um, so I actually worked as a simultaneous interpreter before I did um, literary translation. And the once I, so this is something really that I learned as, as an interpreter, because I would have to think like, what would you sound like when, like if you could speak English, like is your register up here? Is it down here? And because I grew up reading, you know, English literature, I had like this archive of voices where um, you kind of sound more like Carson McCullers, you sound more like Stephen King, like, you know, I could kind of like play with that, um, play with that more. And it's just easier when you have like another voice to kind of like work off of against. I'm sure the writers in the audience have experienced this thing where, you know, your reading pollutes your writing. Like, let's say you, re you, you read like 10 Shakespeare plays before working on your manuscript and suddenly your register is like up here <laughs> and suddenly your English is very Elizabethan. Like, I'm sure you've like, <laughs> like experienced that. <clears throat> um, and yeah, that's, I also, because a lot of, and some writers like hate that and they're like, I make it a point not to read any books when I'm, when I'm writing a book. And I'm like, okay, don't you want to be polluted? Anyway, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, so for me, um, uh, I, I think about, um, Matthew's an uh, actor actually, so like I think about actors a lot where, for example, um, Helen Mirren, when she was playing Queen Elizabeth in The Queen, and she got the, she got the part and she was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is terrifying. I don't know how to play this, this you know, very, very well-known person who is so photographed and so videoed and you know, everyone knows what the queen looks like and sounds like. How am I going to play this character? And she said the first thing that she got down was the voice. She was like, so she tried to like imitate her voice a lot. And once she had, she said, once I had the voice, I can build the entire character around her. Like I could get the walk, I could get the way she set her face and just the way that imitating the way that she talked, it would like change her facial expression. And so once she had the voice, everything else kind of like fell into place. It's exactly the same thing with translation. Translators are very similar to um, actors. So I look at a lot of like actor interviews and listen to a lot of actor interviews. And whenever I talk about translation, I always like give examples from actors talking about their decisions. But um, the process is like, is very kind of, it's, it's very organic. It's really like an actor uh, finding a voice for their character. They, you have to really, uh, it's, it's really not intellectual. Like you have to, look at some source material that makes you feel a certain way or makes you hear certain things. And then you pick up on these vibes essentially, and then you embody it. And then you try to like express it like in the words that you write. I wish I could give you a more academic, intellectual, <laughs> neat way of saying it, but it really is an alchemical process. Where I'm sure actors are much more systemic in their think systematic in their thinking, but, um, yeah, it's um, basically, I think of it as triangulation. I always use a little bit of my own voice. I, I do not, I'm not an, one of those translators who are like, I like to erase myself from the text. No, I have to use my, a little bit of myself in order for it to be more like real. Um, I call it the Nicole Kidman factor where when she was playing um, Virginia Woolf, she said she looked at recordings of Virginia Woolf, but she said, I could do the accent, but it would sound comical like in 2004 or whenever it was that movie came out. So she decided to 
change Virginia Woolf's accent for her portrayal. Like she brought the accent closer to 2004, closer to Nicole Kidman herself, and where she found like a sweet spot between Virginia Woolf and Nicole Kidman. And that worked because that was an incredible performance in the hours. If, please see the movie if you haven't already. So yeah, uh, that's how I kind of like um, triangulate the voice. It's very organic. It's very woo, -woo new agey. It's very, um, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, well, uh, I was wondering, I mean, speaking of like polluting what read, what you read pollutes your writing, I'm curious about like your relationship with translation and your own voice in writing. Um, what does that look like? Is there like a pair of vocal effect or is it like very separated? I'm really curious about um, if or if not they intermingle and, and um, yeah, and even, on, in your upcoming publication, like if if there was an influence of the readers that you recently translated into that? Mm -hmm. um, I guess Love in the Big City by Sang Young Park, my translation of that book, we're both, you know, like the, the, the narrator of that book and I are both like queer Korean men living in Seoul of a certain generation. And so I felt like, oh, he really has to sound like me. <laughs> um, I feel like I sound gayer than Sang Young Park does. Like when you when you when you see Sang Young Park, like he's you know he grew up in Daegu, so he has that very like hyper masculine, um, like whatever. I grew up in Gwacheon, like Gyeonggi-do is very gay, and so <laughs> like Gyeonggi Province is very gay, and so I'm. So the way I'm, uh, I'd be reading his book and, you know, several times in that book, they mentioned like, oh, I knew you were gay by the way you talk. And I'm like, how? <laughs> like, I don't understand how the characters keep thinking young in the book is gay. And so I kind of like gated up a lot. And I was worried because, you know, I, I'm actually a very conservative translator. I don't, I'm not, I don't intervene a lot. And then my husband is like, oh, who cares if it's different as long as it works. And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> it works, I guess. Um, and so that's kind of like a way of, I know it's not quite what you were asking, but that is a way of like certain things like polluting uh, the translation as it comes in. Um, I invite being polluted. Like I, I don't believe in translating from a vacuum. I think it has to pull from whatever is going on in my life as well in order for the translation to really make sense. When you are translating a book, it's exactly like reading. A book, of course, a, a book has a, a classic, <clears throat> a, an excellent work of literature has meaning beyond the period in which it is published. Like, you know, that nine month period where, you know, it's marketed and then marketing drops the book. Like that, like it, a really good book, like I'm reading, if I read Jane Austen in 2023, like it still has certain resonances for me like the reading of it is going to be different and yet very similar and yet very different than when it came out in the 19th century um so uh, for me it's very wh whenever i feel like oh this isn't something that kyung suk shin would have thought when she was writing it doesn't really matter because i'm thinking it when i'm reading it and that's what makes the book relevant when it comes out like that's in this language and so i invite that kind of being polluted and whatnot. And I don't really stress about it. Like, I, uh, um, I, I do believe that books come to you for a reason. And certain books stand out for you in certain moments because your subconscious recognizes that, oh, this is the book that you need to read right now. Like, somehow it, it makes the connection for you. And that's how books find us. It's basically our subconscious sending you the signal that this is what you need to do right now. And so you pick it up and then you read it and then you're like, oh, like this book did not come out when the this book that I was translating um, came out. The, the author could not have known about this book, but it is super relevant to what I'm doing now. And it's a mysterious alchemical process that happens every time I translate a book and you kind of have to go with the flow and not fight it. And you really have to get out of your own way when you translate a book, uh, which is much harder than, than a lot of people think. And it's interesting how, so I didn't study literature as an undergrad. I went to grad school for literature. And what my education gave me 
wasn't like the wasn't control, but over the process, but um, a means to let go and to justify the flow when it's happening and be like, oh, like this is what's going on right now. So because you have that learning and because you've seen that in this book or you you know this theory, this is what's going on. So you have to let it happen. So my entire literary education consists of you have to let it happen, and this is how you let it happen. Yeah. So. Um, polluting is such an ugly word, <laughs> but um, it is very lovely when it's you know happening to you when you're translating. Mm -hmm. We have one last question. Hi, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about making different drafts and how the actual process works for you. Do you sort of start at the beginning, work all the way through? Do you skip over bits? And maybe how much the tone of it changes in subsequent drafts? Thanks. Yeah, um, great question. So um, I like to translate from beginning to end, um, unless there are complicated things that have to do with mark selling the book in the sample stage. But I like to translate books from beginning to end. I like to know as little about like the subsequent pages of the book as possible. I try to forget what I've read in order for the discovery to feel fresh because if it feels fresh for me, it will feel fresh for the reader. Like I will be able to convey that to the reader. Um, for me, I don't, uh, for me, I'm more concerned with, am I hitting the note? Am I hitting the voice? So I don't really change too much between drafts unless it's things like clarifying things, glossing things, or you know, typos and that kind of thing. But there are, for me, there aren't like super dramatic changes between drafts. Um, most of those I uh, hope the editor is able to help me with because that's when it steps in. They, they step in because I think I have a very, very deep belief that publishing is collaborative. Writing is very private. Like writing, writers can write, you know, alone, you know, whatever. Translating, you you need some you are always collaborating with someone like even if your author is dead you're collaborating with their text so we're used to collaborating so at every stage of publishing like once your editor gets it like then it's their work and then you kind of have to respect their reading and their process and then and it's really fun to work with an editor on a translation that you've done because like they take your work very seriously and you take your work very seriously and then so you can kind of like have this really great discussion. I've learned so much from my editors, all of my editors. Um, and so that sometimes those changes are very dramatic, like Violet uh, by Kyung Suk Shin had a really great editor and she drastically changed the tone of the prose, like she really line edited it. Counterweight as well, like it sounds very different from the Korean. The Korean is so impolite. Like this book, like it really runs on rails and that's thanks to Todd Bordnowitz and that's thanks to all of the people at Knopf Pantheon who like worked on the book. Um, so yeah, sometimes when I translate, um, some useful tips for translators, sometimes when I translate a first draft, uh, the author Donye Coles once told me, like, you know, no one cares if the first draft is brilliant, just like, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's shite, just finish it. Like the point of the first draft is that it's done. And so I take that to heart and I just like, I try to translate everything where all of the image order, I don't want to think about like why the image order is in this way, but I try to preserve image order. And so I get a very kind of like verbose translation um, for the first draft. Sometimes I don't want to bother breaking the flow in order to look up a word. So I'll just like keep the word in Korean in the translation and then switch to English back. And then, so it, it looks like a very, very rough, very kind of horrible, horrible piece of work. But again, no one cares if the first draft is bad as long as it's finished. The most important thing is that it's finished and I have preserved um, image order. And then I go back and then I like play with it a bit more. But then I also recognize that this is, um, like I'm not, at that point I have the curse of knowledge. Like I know the source work too well and I know my translation too well. So at some point an editor really has to step in and be able to do uh, the very important process of like refining your uh, sentences, making it more polished and making it seamless. So I rely a lot on editorial. <laughs> Matthew, would you like to wrap it up with your last question? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for everything tonight. Um, I was so nervous to get on stage in Aww. front of all of the people <laughs> watching, but uh, you're such a treat. 
Um, so I'm just going to make my last question a very easy one for you. What do you have? Well, actually, probably not, because you're always working on like 37 projects at once. What do you have coming out that we should look forward to? Oh my God. <laughs> so where do I begin? Um, like, so uh, the last book that I released is uh, Indeterminate Inflorescence by Lee Song Bok. This book is suddenly viral. Um, thank you, RM of BTS, <laughs> um, <laughs> who is in it, who inexplicably in a in a huge like some kind of weird luck because I translated that book um, thinking that you know it'll be a cult favorite like you know maybe you know 50 people will buy it but I didn't care because I love the book so much Indeterminate Inflorescence by Sublunary Press in Seattle and like a, like a month before we published um, RM posted these things on his Instagram and they were a for his Lee Song books a for his so like, I have a book of Lee Sung Book's aphorisms coming out, and like, so interest exploded. And then this really great writer, uh, Anthony Garrett, he posted some uh, at, of the aphorisms like online on Twitter, and then that tweet went viral. Um, so that's one of those moments where like, oh yes, it's hitting. Like I didn't think that it would hit, but it's hitting. So that book is out. It's in its like fourth printing or something. So please grab one while supplies last. Um, next year, I am publishing four books. One of them is my novel, uh, Toward Eternity, from Harper Via. It's coming out in July. I'm about to do the cover reveal. I will when I get back to the hotel. Gorgeous cover. Um, translations, I believe, Blood of the Old Kings by Kim Song-ye from Tor. Um, that's going to be a really fun fantasy, high fantasy book. It's very cinematic. Um, it was like high fantasy and cinematic at the same time. So I'm like, so it was very difficult to translate, but I'm so glad that it came out. That, it, that the translation came out the way it did. And um, God, what are the other? I was like counting them. Um, Bora Chang 2, Your Utopia is also coming out. Uh, it's called Your Utopia. It's a collection of short stories about sad robots. And um, I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tteokbokki 2, which is titled I Want to Die, But I Still Want to Eat Tteokbokki. <laughs> is coming out sometime in the spring. That's four books. I feel like I am forgetting a book that is also coming out next year. Um, but I... It's a good thing. Yes. It's a good thing. Yes. This year I have, yeah, this book come out. I went to see my father by Kyung Suk Shin. I have to mention it because Kyung Suk Shin messaged me and said, why don't you ever mention my book? And I'm like, I mention it all the time. Oh my God. Like, I go to every bookstore in New York to see if it's like, yeah. It's sold out at the Strand. Like she like signed a whole pile of them and I can't find a single copy of them at the Strand because I was complaining to her, why did you go to the Strand and not sign any books? And she's like, what are you talking about? I signed a whole pile. And then it turned out that there was none. I went to see my father by Kyung Suk Shin. Please go get that book. Um, and um, yeah, so, oh God, what was, the, what was the book that I released in July? It'll come to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, author. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It's, um, this has been a really wild year because when you're an author, you enter the publicity cycle like once every three, five years. But when you're a translator, it's like, you're done with this book, enter the cycle for this book. Oh, now you have to enter the cycle for this book. And I'm like, I am like showing my face in things like all the time. And I, I, I'm sure everyone has like, is that the only Korean translator in the world? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are grateful yeah. for the abundance of work that you put in the world. Thank you so much again. Uh, oh, the BTS these. book. Yeah, that's, that was the uh, that's other. Yeah, <laughs> the number one New York Times bestseller. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Do I do a spiel? Um, there are copies of, of Counterweight available for purchase. Thank you, you and me books. Please buy it. It's so good. Um, I'm a big fan. And uh, I would love everyone, uh, just Anton, thank you for coming here. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you for Chris Society. Thank you, Matthew.